Focus. We are here with President of the Cooperative Credit Union League of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as Phyton, uh, Joseph Remy. We also have a businessman and trained economist, Mr. Kaim Sheikh. Uh, we already heard from the current Deputy Chief Sec of the THA. We are joined now by a former Deputy Chief Sec uh, in the form of Mr. Joel Jack. And gentlemen, we want to thank you for staying with us. Mr. Jack, welcome. Thank you for making it over. No, we heard what the deputy chief sec would have said. What are your thoughts? And let's start. Let's start general, <laughs> and then try to come a little more specific. Thank you. Well, thank you, DK, for having me on. Let me say, first of all, a special good evening, good night to all of Trinidad, all of Tobago, and um, I'm just coming from the the parliament after listening to the minister of finance. This, this is his ninth budget presentation. He has eclipsed me by one budget presentation, having served as Secretary of Finance and Economy since 2013. And let me see that it was a, a very comprehensive statement indeed. And I think he has even eclipsed his, um, you know, in terms of the length, because he had, you know, so much to say, but it was really a forward thinking budget. Some of the measures outlined by the government really would assist in transforming the Trinidad Tobago economy. Um, he touched on a lot of um, various issues. Um, first of all, when you look at the fact that he spoke in, in such detail about um, digitization, about fintech, um, moving to a cashless society, he touched on some of the innovations in um, industrialization to attract foreign direct investment, he spoke about the job creation at Phoenix Park of over 4,500 jobs. And in terms of that, that new act, um, you know, the, uh, replacing that, that old free zone act, um, you know, so it was fairly comprehensive, touching on crime, agriculture, job creation, and of course, um, our energy sector outlining the plans to deal with um, primarily gas shortage. Um, that we're facing um, over the few years, moving from um, getting us back up to um, for BCF, where we are currently at 2.4. Um, he spoke in detail about um, the achievement and the work of the Minister of Energy and the Prime Minister in negotiating um, that. Lauren Manati daily also spoke about the the various projects being that have been undertaken by the energy sector. And of course, when you look at the, the other fiscal incentives um, that were outlined, I think when you look at it holistically, it really augurs well for um, the Trent Tobago economy over the, the short term. And I think all of Trent Tobago um, should be optimistic looking um, at the future. And when you also place the budget in context, the budget is not... Um, was not crafted in isolation because the, the, the budget statement is anchored in the Vision 2030 document. And uh, I think that is important for, um, for us to remember and for Trinidad and Tobago to understand the, the framework underpinning the budget statement. And this is important to facilitate economic growth, to ensure that we have sustainable economic development, and that, you know, the, that we look ahead not just for 2023 but we need to look at where should Trinidad be in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. What are the plans and the measures that we need to implement now? How do we finance those plans and how do we ensure that we um, place the economy on a sound footing and that we instill resilience in the Trinidad and Tobago economy? Well sometimes it's is interesting words that can be used. So, like, one of the things that was harped on was the finance minister saying, "Good luck," after talking about the allocation to Tobago. Uh, looking at the fact that you said he touched on crime, and so the person said, "Who, who, who might ask the question? We wish that you'd go into it a little more. Is it that we're waiting on Parliament?" as they reconvene on Friday, so you didn't want to steal the Minister of National Security's thunder, or is it that you could have gotten a little meatier with it? Well, the Minister spoke for over four hours. And uh, you know, in my experience, you have so much to say in such little time, because 
for me, I would be editing up to Friday, sometimes Sunday. You're still trying to ensure that you get everything in that you want to see. But he had so much to say. And of course, I agree with you and all of Trinidad and Tobago that crime is important. It's important to all of us and we need to get the crime rate down. And I think the measures outlined in the budget in terms of the recruitment of the officers, a thousand or so, um, <clears throat> what we indicated as part of our medium term planning framework in terms of, um, and somebody might ask, what is that? But the medium term planning framework was our medium term planning document for Tobago. And uh, um, as part of our strategic um, economic development process. And in terms of treating with crime, we, we recommended at the time that we look at recruiting not just officers um, at the level of constables, but you also need to recruit in terms of management, um, also look at um, criminologists, ensuring that we staff out some of them, the, the, those other areas that will aid in not just crime fighting, but also increasing the detection rate of crisis and assisting prosecuting those persons um, who are criminals um, indeed. So again, um, the Ministry of National Security received, um, you know, it, it, I would say a fair share of the budget and we look forward to the implementation of the measures outlined to address the issue of crime that is confronting Trinidad and Tobago. And speaking about the Ministry of National Security, one of the things that we look at sometimes is the way that allocations take place. So some of those big ticket items or the major allocations would be education, national security, health. So I think we want to show national security, we want to show education, and then we want to show health as the, as the allocations were presented this afternoon by the finance minister. So we just spoke about national security, so I think we'll get a, a look at that at this point in time. $6.2371 billion uh, in 2019, 6.120. In 2020, 6.440. In 2021, it took a dip to $5.227 $5.664 5 in 2022, $5.798 in 2023. And I believe this time around it is something like 6.912. Uh, don't hold me to that, but I think it's around is around that figure. And we will speak about some of the others as we as we continue with the conversation. But sometimes it feels as though we can throw money at a solution or throw resources at a solution. One of the things I want to ask, gentlemen, is how do we have some intentional strategic partnerships to say, okay, well, we don't each need to invent or reinvent the wheel, but you're doing this, I'm doing this, let us pool our resources together. What are some of the places that you would like to see that best place or best position? And let me start with the businessman and economist, please, Mr. Sheikh. Sure. So when it is, I think, of national security, I don't think that we should just be spending money purchasing vehicles only. I think that it is we need to look at firstly creating employment so people don't need to go into crime. I think that it is we need to probably expand the community. How is the community connected with the crime as well? Because the community is very important to creating that atmosphere where it is they understand each other and there's not a need to get into those illegal activities. Also, yes, it is we have the, the net that they speak about around the around the, sorry, I'm catching, I'm, I'm missing it. But we have to capture on gun control. There's way too many guns in the economy at the moment. And the best way to do that is to put some more money into customs. Yes, they did, they said four scanners, but I mean, I think that only happened on the 22nd of September, what happened for the time before that. But we need to do more than just scanners. We need to have more police and recruiting policemen is great, but I don't think that just recruiting policemen is going to be enough. We need to have them properly trained and we probably need some additional assistance from external. And the justice system also needs to be more adequate. It takes too long for things to pass through. So if it is we have things that are finishing faster, cases completed faster, then it is we could see some resolution much quicker. And I also think that 
when there's such a large inequality between the upper class and the lower class, this inequality tends to push towards crime. And the best way to do that is to try to reduce the poverty by creating employment. That's my views on it. So like it's looking at the fact that you're looking at the entire ecosystem right. because many people don't go into a life of crime by choice as opposed to looking at the situation around them and saying, okay, well, this they find is the most viable alternative. So if you increase or improve the condition around them, uh, they will go in a manner that's a little more positive. But see, you look in the sky and then you look down and you nod your head like if there was a if there was a collection plate, you'd put something in it, Mr. <laughs> Emery. We have about five minutes before we take the break. Let's hear from you. No, it's just that there are so much times we feel that pumping money behind crime solutions will help. One of the things, and, and the minister alluded to the fact that they intend to recruit 1,000 additional police officers. I agree with Mr. Sheikh. That is not going to resolve the issue. It sounds very good theoretically. But what pool are we, we, we recruiting from? And one of the things the League said when we made our statement prior to the budget, we said it is critical that the recruitment system for office holders within the law enforcement arena, such as police, army, coast guard, and others, be strategically strengthened so we could get the best fit for office. And we find that too much at times we, we keep talking about rogue elements in the service and you, when you live on the, in the communities, you hear the fact that there are police officers in alignment with the criminal elements. That is the allegations you hear on the street. If we don't find the right method of recruiting the best fit for the service, we are going to continue to have problems. That's one area. And then there was this strong emphasis on community policing some years ago that has just disappeared. That was, that was the relationship and the connection, the nexus between the community and law enforcement. That has disappeared. And then we talk about the link between law enforcement and the justice system. And, and it, it takes a lot. You know, you have people going to the system. And, and what we're doing inside of the, the um, jails and those, the prison service, is it appears that there's a feeding ground for the creation of new criminal elements, instead of we seeing people rehabilitated to fit back into society, into productive areas. And that is why we have been saying in the cooperative credit union movement that let us take the values and virtues of the cooperative business model, all the ethical values that are there, imbue it from a young age in our young, in our young citizens, get it into the curriculums in school so that they leave school well equipped with, a level, with competencies that can allow them to be the whole person. And thereafter, they will make a more meaningful contribution. And then you put the systems in place in the respective communities to engage them in meaningful endeavors. And, and that whole issue of national service, there was a fleeting mention of it. I think it should be more pronounced in a manner that will allow most, if not all, of our young persons to transit through a developmental program that will build pride and patriotism you know, I, I read an article recently where they talk about the, the, how the deplorable condition that exists now in the cadet force, which was one of the entry points in the military service. And if we don't provide the, uh, the resources to feed for those feeder um, areas, then we are going to continue to have the same problems. We're going to put more police in the service, more persons, and they are not going to make any fundamental difference because we are not going to arrest the fundamental issues that is driving criminal elements towards what they're doing. The economic system sometimes fosters people to engage in criminal activities, and we need to find all the levers that allow them to link themselves to criminal activities, cut them off, and the things have to be done simultaneously. While you're dealing with the current situation, you have to imbue in the younger ones the mindset for them not to go into that area, that, that criminal activities. And it, it can't be on one way street in terms of resolving this. You pump money, you build, bring um, the, you give the police service boats and all kind of thing. But with what about the guns that are already in Trinidad and Tobago? How are we going to eradicate those though? What are we going to do? Is, are we going to bring in a gun amnesty? What are we going to do? How, what are the things we are going to do to get the guns off the streets? They are already in the country. So the scanners are going to only take up what is coming in in the future. 
We can't scan what has already been here. They are in the system. We need to get rid of those things. And I really like that fact that you talk about that community element. You also, I, well, I guess Pon was intended when talking about arresting the crime situation. But in terms of being a country boy and knowing everyone around you, everyone around right. know you. Mm -hmm. So if you do something, that's right. Your parents most likely going to hear about it before, and you may get disciplined before you reach home too. So you get your dose there, you get your dose there. However, it be it stern. How, right. how does that? How does that community aspect in terms of bringing? national security to the fore. How, how, how do you treat with it, Mr. Jack? Well, in the Tobago context, um, when, and you know, the Tobago economy is primarily tourism based, and in the past when they were announcing crime statistics for the country, we would tell them to disaggregate it because in the Tobago context, we have a very, you know, low crime rate in the past. We've seen a, an uptick in the numbers. But in terms of that community policing, that, that community, everyone knows each other because it's really a whole of society approach. And while I hold no brief for the Minister of National Security, I believe what they're ruling out now is part of a, a crime plan. So we have all the elements. We need more patrols in the communities. So we need the vehicles. We, there's a deficiency in terms of the manpower, in terms of manpower resources, we're treating with that. Uh, we're going to work in terms of with the judiciary in terms of ensuring that we improve the efficiency. And I know um, if it's next week or within the next two weeks when we have the opening of the, 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 the law term, the chief justice will come out and talk about the challenges, you know, in terms of the road that they have traveled thus far and the plans for the future. We, we, you know, we, he, the minister spoke also about introducing all the the e systems in place to improve productivity to to ensure that the government system runs effectively. So, in terms of dealing with the crime, as we, we and as as the previous chief secretary would say in Tobago, crime cannot happen in the Tobago context without somebody knowing. You know, your neighbor must report one another, and that goes back to the social fabric and the work of the ministry of social development, the, the Ministry of Youth. And so we have a whole host of programs to impact youth, those who are out of school, the ones who score below 50%. The minister also referenced that in terms of some intervention and training programs for them. I was excited about the, the, the yachting apprenticeship program. I was excited about the job creation opportunities for the 4,500 um, young people. So we are creating the opportunities for the young people. The question is, how do we get the young people to really make use of these opportunities? And I'm excited as well when I hear an investment in SME development in terms of putting more funding in, in um, institutions such as NEDCO because we did pretty well in, in terms of investing significant funds close to $75 million to create indigenous entrepreneurs in Tobago. And that is a model that we need to, to use in terms of providing that support and that ecosystem um, so that we can really engage our young people coming out of schools, linking with the tertiary education system to provide the training. And then we need to unlock um, ad adequate capital to fund some of these ideas. So when they come out from the training programs, from YAPA, from the, the Yachting ap Apprenticeship Program, they, we, they need to come out with the confidence that funding is available for me to start my business enterprise, to transform my idea into a, a tangible entrepreneurial pursuit. You see that point that you're making about unlocking that capital, that is something that we're going to get back to. I really even want to dive back into that indigenous entrepreneurs who have the competence and the capacity to say, okay, well, we can make a difference. But I'm glad this is not a football match because when you sub out, you can't come back in. That is not the case here. We are going to have a small substitution. So stay with us. We take a short break and return with more. The Equal Opportunity Commission was established in 2008 with a mandate to work towards eliminating discrimination and promoting equality of opportunity. The main functions of the EOC are outlined in the Equal Opportunity Act. They are to receive, investigate, and as far as possible, conciliate allegations of discrimination, to keep the Act under review, and submit proposals for amendments when necessary, to develop, conduct, 
and foster research and educational programs for the purpose of eliminating discrimination and promoting equality, and to prepare and publish appropriate guidelines for the avoidance of discrimination. The EOC also offers free services such as legal advice on discrimination, inclusivity training sessions for organizations, appearances on webinars and panels, and partnering with organizations and NGOs. To learn more, visit our website at www.equalopportunity.gov.tt or any of our social media pages. Welcome back to Budget In Focus. We are very happy to be able to get some insight and sharing from Minister of Planning and Development, Penelope Beckles. Thank you so much for making the time. I see you have a, a page that is folded <laughs> over. So I want to ask, what is, the, what is the main thing that stood out to you, that one point that was at the top of your list with regard to the budget as presented by Finance Minister? Thanks. Well, you know, first of all, I think it's the issue of the theme. Eh? I mean, it's important, um, building capacity for diversification and growth. Um, and as a small island developing state, from time to time it matters know where, where you travel. People all talk about the issue of capacity building. Um, and one of the challenges I think we are facing now with the whole procurement legislation is the extent to which we are ready, uh, whether we have the capacity, whether or not the ministries um, have built that capacity to be able to deliver. So a couple months um, following the passage of the legislation and always the issue of diversification because as most people say to you, oil and sec oil, the oil sector, the gas sector, that's where the discussion is. But we have seen growth in the non-energy sector and that's, that's good news. So for me, I, I love the, the thought of building the capacity to deliver because I think that's where it is, especially in the context of the diversification. One of the things when you have a conversation right after the budget and you don't necessarily get to pass through as much as you would like, some things you may have missed your attention, just slipped for a second. Mm -hmm. So in terms of PSIP and those programs, uh, what are some of those aspects of the budget that would impact the national development that mm -hmm. would have been discussed this afternoon? Well, you know, what is interesting, because I saw a while ago that you put up the major fiscal 2024 allocations. Um, and I always think as somebody who from time to time, you know, when you, you have the opportunity to look at the discussions, the real issue is what are the expectations of the public? You know, what are the areas that people really feel it's important? You know, the, the crime, the health sector, the education. Now, even though you would see that those are some of the areas that would have had the greatest of allocations. It's still, you know, people think about going to the hospital, so are there drugs, you know, whether the hospitals can deliver in the way in which you expect. And a, a while ago you were talking about crime. So the health sector, education, crime, those are always three of the big ticket items. Um, and if we were to go back maybe even 10 years ago, you would still see that the education sector, the health sector, national security, those are always 
three of the of the big areas. But in terms of the PSIP, you talked about just over six billion dollars. Um, the focus, of course, in terms of um, road infrastructure, uh, community development, uh, the water sector. It's no secret that the average Trinidadian, you know, you have the complaints about, about the roads. And in the budget, again, the Ministry of Works got a substantial allocation and Minister made reference to the road infrastructure. So we know that the expectations there in the public would definitely would be, you know, let's see what's happening in the next year and how that would impact. Because that's all about your, basically, your standard of living, um, your comfort, you know, you leave home, you're on your way to work, you're dropping children off to school, you're going in the market, those basic things. Um, and what is the impact if, you, if you're, if you you know, in terms of damage to the tire, damage to your rims? Um, so, yes. And I think this is a beautiful opportunity for you mm -hmm. to share, Mr. Sheikh, in terms of real time, how that can affect business uh, in terms of... Sometimes we don't necessarily think that things may be related, but looking at quality of road to how you are able to implement business or execute your, your, your business methodology. So share with us, thanks. Sure, no problem at all. So when it is I look at it, for instance, some of the areas of Trinidad, especially in the southeastern portion, areas like Rio Claro, Mayaro, we don't go anymore from a delivery perspective. The roads are just too difficult. The time it takes, it's not worth it to send a driver and the value of the income in that area might not be worth it. So we either lose that business or we try to force the customer to come to us. Even if it is you try to move the business away from delivering yourself towards a delivery service, even the delivery service will do it a few times and then they'll stop. Thankfully, it is the road to Point Fortin has opened, so that's great. We actually could do a lot more business at Point Fortin now, but even in some parts like um, towards Grandy, is, is very difficult, even beyond Grandi to San Chiquito and so forth. Very difficult roads. And looking at it um, for the last three to four years, the number of vehicles has not increased that we have in our business. But our vehicle maintenance expense has increased. Not, um, we're talking suspension issues, we're talking tires, the amount of damaged tires we get because of potholes, because you can't estimate the depth of a pothole, <laughs> especially when it's raining. So we lose a lot of in those simple things and it, it really makes it difficult for business and even when you try to force the customer to come to you, they don't want to. So we lose business in those areas where the roads are really bad. And that's how it is we have to just let it be for now. Please. Come in because um, he mentioned the point 14. So at the same time, I mean, it's always a question of road construction as well as maintenance. Um, because we do know that we do have some road stock, that some roads that haven't been um, resurfaced for a while. But at the same time, you know, because of the, the, the fact that you have new housing communities. So you go to point, you see the road construction. And even as he spoke about Grandy, but of course, just a couple of months ago as well, that um, infrastructure, that road from Valencia, you know, to Toku, um, not not totally completed, but you see a substantial work and then you have the continuation of that. Um, you have the completion of that road network around Valsey in there. And then just a couple of days ago, the minister turned the sod in, at the Omera intersection there to deal with the traffic. So, you know, you're looking at um, the improvement of your housing stock, um, construction of new houses, new communities. So every time you have a new housing uh, community being built, it means you have to have road infrastructure. So you have new areas, but then you have to continue to maintain your existing existing stock. I think part of it is also all hands on deck approach because sometimes we need to wonder what it is we can do a little differently. Because in terms of trying to get to areas, you, you, if there's an area that you get to on a consistent basis, now you try to learn, okay, what are alternative routes you can take? Okay, if, the, if I take this back road, I can reach. But sometimes you see these connector roads and then you see these trucks that are just yes. laden, yeah. according to the impressed down shaking together, running over and literally yeah. too heavy for the road at that point in time. So it's all looking at what everyone brings to the table. How are we all responsible, although we like the best for what it is we're dealing with. But I started off, Mr. Jack, asking you, give me the macro. 
but I didn't ask you specifically about the allocation or the conversation as by the finance minister about Tobago. And then we would have had the current deputy chief secretary speak to the fact that they were hoping for a little closer to the 6.9. So they were hoping that it was a little more in the middle <laughs> as opposed to the 4.3 percent. What, what are your thoughts? Two words, dishonest and disingenuous. You know, and every time I hear the chief secretary, the deputy chief secretary talk about Tobago's allocation, it, it saddens me, it pains me, and it pains me for, for three reasons. One, as secretary of finance, and over the, the last four or so years, when I was making those presentations, they would tell me, cut your, cut your, your request. So I would request approximately $5 billion um, in funding, and they would say, no, cut your claw to suit. That's one instance. The second instance was when a bill was brought before Parliament to give Tobago a minimum of 6.9% of the budgetary allocation. So you, you can't, sorry, if I get emotional. So, you would, so that bill was, and we wanted bipartisan support from members opposite. We did not get it. We needed support from the same, the current Deputy Chief Secretary and the Chief Secretary and his team. We did not get it. So to come now and say your expectation was 6.9% when you had an opportunity for minimum, the floor was 69 Additionally, in that bill, it made provision for a, a fiscal review committee where we could have articulated for additional funding to advance the Tobago economy. Because Secretary of Finance, I have outlined on several occasions, any investment in Tobago is an opportunity for national economic development, not just for Tobago. Because I've been saying that Tobago is an opportunity to play a meaningful role in national economic development. And those were the two instances. So we got no support when we made the budgetary request. We got no support for the autonomy bill. Now I hear they are jumping on the autonomy, the autonomy and, and articulating when they were responsible for ensuring that that bill was the real because they could have spoken to their UNC friends and partners opposite to support the bill. And that bill, though not perfect, that bill represented a significant advancement in the terms of Tobago's autonomy. So they are responsible for us not getting that 6.9%. The third reason that they are responsible for stymieing Tobago's development is that Sandals Hotel project on the island. When I look at what is happening in St. Vincent now, the, the brand new um, Sandals St. Vincent, I cringe. Because that would have transformed Tobago and Trinidad and Tobago, and I tell you why. In terms of the, you know, when we, when we did the analysis, I mean, I'm not just talking off the top of my head. We took the time when the deal was announced. We did the analysis in the Division of Finance, and we did the estimate in terms of how much revenue we would earn and approximately, was approximately, if I remember correctly, was half a billion dollars. I'll give you the, the, before we leave. And that would have ensured that the Tobago economy would have been transformed, zero unemployment. But most importantly, all the um, nascent industries, agriculture, all the necessary linkages with the arts, with the service providers would have been, that would have been a significant game changer for Tobago. But most importantly, have solved three problems for us. Room stock gap of which Tobago currently experienced between 2,500 and 3,500. Promotion of the destination Tobago, Sandals is their skill at that. Getting heads in bed and promoting destination. And they would have solved that problem for us. And the third was airlift. I cite the Grenada e example all the time. Before Sandals got to Grenada, American Airlines flew to Grenada three times per week. Now, American Airlines, they fly to Grenada on a daily basis with a load factor of upwards of 85%. Sandals, room stock, even when it's supposed to be the low season, it's upwards of, of 80%. So, and uh, everyone knows, all of Grenada knows by Sandals coming how it transformed the Grenada economy. 
screen of the economy. So Tobago lost out again based on the actions of the persons who are now in power articulating that they would get that they should get 6.9% when they, in fact, did everything to prevent Tobago from getting a minimum of 6.9% of the national budget. You see, Mr. Jack BK, I'm, I am emotional, yes, because I feel the pain for the island. And when I look at persons who are now in power articulating that the government does not care. If there's any government that cares for Tobago, it is this administration. In 2015, we moved from the barest minimum of 4.03% to 4.4%. The Minister of Finance stated at the onset that he was willing to work with us first to advance Tobago's development from just using the funding from our allocation. Um, and we created a policy called the Alternative Financing Mechanism. And the Minister of Finance said, Joel, you have my support. For the first time in the history of the Assembly, we were able to raise bond financing with approval of approximately $300 million. We raised the first tranche, $166 million. And that went towards supporting the island's development. So if there's any administration that cares about Tobago, that is supportive of Tobago, the proof is in the pudding. The brand new airport that was supposed to be linked with the new sandals, two brand new police stations that won the books for since 2010, Chauvin, Roxborough, a brand new fire station in Roxborough, uh, a new hospital in Roxborough, new administrative complex, and I can go on and on and on, new Roxborough Hospital. So we have seen over the, from 2015 to now, the support of this administration for the island's development and to give to be an opportunity to contribute to national economic development. But if we go on and on, before we go on and on, we take a short break. If this, if, if this, if this, if this, if this was village cricket, the way you hit that full toss, it would have been six and out. But we take a short break. We continue with yes. both budget and focus when we return. Stay with us. Yes. Cravings for savings begins at Passat's Deep Food King. Nestle Orchard Apple and Orange Drink, one liter, two packs, now $20. Matuk's Mayonnaise, 375 ml, two packs, $29.99. Blue Band Margarine, three packs, now $25. Pepsi and 7-Up Soft Drink, 500 ml, seven bottles, now $20. Country Pride All Purpose, 10 kg, $79.99. Fresh Harvest Frozen Green Pigeon Peas, two packs, now $28.99. Halal Bone Goat, four pounds, now $75. Chicken Leg Quarters, three pounds. Now $20. Habibi soybean oil, 2 liters, $29.99. Pork stew per pound, $13.99. Crown Parboil Rice, 3 packs for $22. Swiss pasta cuts, 300 grams, 4 packs, now $19.99. Catelli tomato ketchup, 750 ml, 3 packs, now $18. Fresh harvest red kidney beans, 3 tins, now $20. King's corn beef, 2 tins for $28.99. Stay lens, October 8th, or while stocks last. Facades Deep Food King, caring for you like family. Born out of a desire to create a shift in the atmosphere which surrounded the Calypso Gael, enter the tent, which replaced the palm leaf roof with a piece of tarpaulin, 
bamboo benches with actual chairs and the introduction of an orchestra to accompany the Calypsonians and kerosene lamps and flambeau to light the way. Calypso tent that had real pedigree too. Who could forget Calypso spectacular on Henry Street? Where true, true, true Calypso finds they would meet. मेरी फैमिली बहुत स्ट्रेस से चल रही है वक्त नहीं है रोमांस करने का Welcome back to Budget in Focus. We have another minister with us, Minister of Public Utilities, Marvin Gonzalez. Thank you for making the time. What's the thing that stood out to you in today's budget presentation? Um, the the tone of the budget was very positive, very upbeat, because over the last couple of years, the government has been grappling with a lot of external factors to manage the country. Um, in 2015 to 2020, the government. Uh, started a number of initiatives and programs to stabilize the economy. And, um, and as they started seeing positive growth in the economy, we had the pandemic in 2020. And the pandemic would have caused, as you know, um, the international you know, borders were closed. We had to shut down our airline. We had to be sh shut down. We now had to initiate programs in the health sector to save lives, etc. And of course, it had tremendous negative impact on, on the economy. And as we were coming out of that, we had the Russian-Ukraine war, which also had its own negative implications. So we were grappling with quite a lot. And I remember the Prime Minister saying at some point in time that we will grapple and we will, we will take our own bitter medicine. And he will not take Trinidad and Tobago to the International Monetary Fund as occurred in other Caribbean countries. Because, of course, if we go to the, the IMF, we would have to comply with the IMF prescription, which, of course, can have serious implications and social fallout. So we managed in difficult circumstances. Um, we were able to stabilize the economy, and we returned to positive economic growth as confirmed by our international rating agencies. And because of that, and some of the systems that we put in place and how we were able to manage the economy tightly over the last years, the government was now able to pursue programs and initiatives to assist the lower income groups in the society. The support that we put forward to assist parents um, to, to purchase educational supplies for their children, the increase in minimum wage, the, um, the, the, the pursuance of other initiatives to support economic development and what have you, the expansion of our food program to support needy um, income owners, etc. So for me, this is an indication that we are growing and as we continue to grow, we will continue to provide for the vulnerable groups in the society. And we are only able to do that because we manage in difficult circumstances over the last seven or eight years. And once we continue like that, we will, as a government, continue to provide for the um, the lower income groups in the society. So that is what stood out to me today. I like the fact that you talk about uh, school books as well, and I am one person looking forward to the standardization <laughs> because my, both of my parents taught, my father used to talk about sometimes you have someone, they take a book and they change apples to mangoes and they want to sell it again. This mm -hmm. is the Caribbean edition yeah. and, and you're supposed to buy it. But even looking at that streamlining, uh, in terms of the, the money that is going into public utilities this year round, and we're looking at transformation, how does that impact something like the Community Water Improvement Program in the sense that it may not be the most money that is going into that particular thing in that community, Correct. but it, what kind of effect does it have? Positive effect because of the success of the Community Water Improvement Program over the last two years where we went into various communities around Trinidad and Tobago 
And if the issue is the development of a well, the expansion of your pipeline network, the construction of a new water treatment plant, the refurbishment of a booster station, we would have undertaken 60 projects around the country successfully in two years, record breaking for the Water and Sewage Authority. Because one of the issues that we had in Wasa, it was not a lack of funding, but sometimes the government allocate large funding to the authority. And because of the internal dysfunctions, the, pro the lengthy procurement process, lack of project management, etc., the country does not get the benefit of the investment and the commitment that the government is making. Because you can send $1 billion, Minister Beckers, as a former Minister of Public Utilities, could tell you, or my colleague here would tell you as, you know, serving, you know, as Secretary for Finance, that if you allocate, and the allocation of monies to state enterprises is not going to solve the problem. If you do not treat with the management issues to ensure that projects that are undertaken are brought to successful completion in record time, then the population will not experience the benefits. The CWE program, Community Water Improvement Program, we, we had a different approach in how these projects have been managed. We appointed team leads, and every week they had to come out and account for the progress. And because of that robust project management um, system that we put in place, we were able to, uh, to complete 60 projects in just, um, in just two years. The Hillsborough, the desilting of the Hillsborough Dam is one example of a, pro a project that was talking about in a long, spoken about in a long time. And we were able to do that in two years. And, we, and it, it came in with a cost savings of $10 million. Record breaking. We were able to construct a 7.4 kilometer pipeline, 16 inch pipeline from Signal Hill right. to, to Apex building. Mm -hmm. That happened in 45 days. Mm -hmm. Proper project management. So the government is saying, well, look, listen, um, Minister Beckers is leading the, the transformation team. And we're looking at the organizational transformation. And very soon, the country will be told of the new leadership structure for the Water and Sewage Authority. But as we do that, the government is now allocating over $1 billion to upgrade aging infrastructure in the authority, the investment in automation, removal of um, old pipelines around the country, the construction of new wells around the country. And I can tell you that Minister Beckles, was, when she was Minister of Public Utilities, under, took a very successful well rehabilitation mm -hmm. um, or well development program in Tobago. Yeah. And Tobago is benefiting from that mm -hmm. because the problems that we have in Trinidad in some areas, Tobago is far better in terms of a uh, consistent supply of water because of the investment that was made at that point in time in groundwater resources. And that is exactly what we are doing now. We are going into communities that was done in Tobago a couple of years ago. We are drilling new wells and those wells will now be the main source of water to these communities as opposed to um, depending on the current water treatment plant, the North Oropos water treatment plant. Those plants have been constructed over 20, 30 years and they are stretched. So we now have to go and localize the source of water so that we can have a more reliable supply of water. So I'm very excited with the allocation made for the Water and Sewage Authority. And, um, yeah. Yes, it was three billion yeah. in yeah. utilities, yeah. and um, but we are also going to ensure that we have a project management approach where the country is going to see value for money. I just wanted to say something very quickly yes. in relation to Tobago, and one of the things that Minister Embert pointed out that even though you have this allocation for Tobago, Tobago also benefits. From almost a 600, 700 million dollars. Uh, 70, 70 million, 60 to 70 million dollars additional. But what I would also say is that when uh, Minister Gonzalez spoke about the drilling of those wells, th that, that fund did not come from the THE. There's a lot of funds that come from other ministries that requests would be made from the THE sure. or its continuing projects. So, in addition to the allocation, I think there's another. Um, a couple yeah. 700 million a couple, dollars yeah about 700 million yes, and then i think yes. they got an increase from 70 so there's a 700 additional million dollars that the tha would get 
that is allocated to several other ministries to do in Tobago as well. And, we, and we're thankful for that context. So mm -hmm. it's, it's good when you have someone who's able to say, okay, well, this is the work that you did. Oh, yeah, because sure. self-raise mm -hmm. is, no, is no recommendation. Mm -hmm. well, the, the record breaker, because he spoke about the Hills Road Dam, but I think he was just being <laughs> a bit conservative and not tooting his own. But uh, we, I could point out about three or four other major projects on the island undertaken by the minister to bring relief to persons the Charlotteville, um, mm. French Fort, booster stations. Mount Pleasant Schubert. booster, Schubert booster stations, and a mm. number. Mm. And that, what what it what this means, it highlights the, the collaboration between the minister, central the various government. ministries, central government, and the two Tobago MPs, you know, to ensure that we bring meaningful development to Tobago. And and, and the minister spoke about the in, in the past yes, when yeah. we we drilled those wells. That was a period in time when the teacher did not have the money mm -hmm. and the hoteliers in the southwest, tourism right. and all the other areas, they were crying right. out, they were right. crying, right. crying out, yeah. but working together, we As solved that problem. Fact, importing water from Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Badges. Yes. That's so, right. so we were in crisis mode <laughs> wow. and working. So this is not a time for confrontation, it's about collaboration, mm -hmm. working together to solve problems and again, ensuring that Tobago um, increases its contribution to national economic activity. Um, in terms of the allocation, they are getting about $64, $70 million additionally. And again, you look at the minister's stance at midterm, the THA asked $100 million additional, and the minister was, was, was forthcoming to assist. And, you know, when you look at how we allocate scarce resources in the past, you know, when I'm allocated, I said, you know, thank the minister because not just the allocation, but there are other projects that we will work towards in terms of ensuring that Tobago develops. We could point to Cove, Minister. There's an, a nat natural gas is landed in Tobago. There's an NGC station in Tobago. We could talk about the Cove dual powered station again. That wasn't funded by the, the THA, that was undertaken in collaboration and partnership with, this, with the central government. This is, this is a time of acrimony. This is a time for us to work together. Mm -hmm. It's about national economic development. And in terms of that point of working together, Mr. Jack, you, you would in recent in recent succession, you'd have said, well, you'd have said twice in going into the past. And that is something that I want to do. Fun fact, the last time we had a budget presentation on the 2nd of October was in 2017. But even to go a little further back, last week, I want to say congratulations, Minister Beckles, on the 28th of September, there was this history and future intersecting in terms of preserving the intellectual legacy of Dr. Eric yes. Williams mm -hmm. through digitalization. I want you to speak to that please the significance of being able to go and get that historical context see what the an original intention was and how we can in almost in the spirit of Sankofa go back and get it get those uh, those points of reference in to help influence how it as we move forward but you know what's interesting about that project is that um, the credit has to go to the staff I mean there's somebody who kept these documents there. It took about 13 years. Somebody had the speeches, kept it, you know, and waited until the right time. So in truth and in fact, it, in terms of the cost to the ministry, um, it's really the employees of the Ministry of Planning and Development, Library Services, who came together um, and had this passion to ensure that what was something that, I mean, it was a momentous occasion. People didn't even know that those speeches existed. And some so, of them even with the notations with, on Still the, on with the page, his right? original handwriting. So you can go and you can actually see some of those original speeches. And now with technology, I mean, um, the Honorable Prime Minister had that concept of setting up the Ministry of Digitalization. And it means now that you, again, we're going back to going back to the issue of the theme, you know, which is, you know, that whole building of the of the capacity and the diversification. So here it is. You always remember the most important resource of your country is still human resource. So now you can go and access 200 plus of Eric Williams speeches, know a little bit more. And if you, one of the things that came up was that he actually started talking about telecommunications uh, and transformation of, of the sector, um, you know, way back in the 19, would have been 70s or oh. 80s, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, um, and so many people don't know about Eric Williams. I mean, we talk about um, technology you now, the ease mm -hmm. with which you can go and even have a, sp a speech written for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's there. So, but again, the father of the nation, somebody who is who had the vision for Trinidad and Tobago being what it is today, and the fact that young people, people all over the world now can go and just with the press of a button yeah. and you can access, access the speech. So I just want to, Eric, Eric, Erica Williams, Carmel, Carnell, she, she attended. And, and of course, we had the staff who were all responsible. And I just want to use the opportunity again to thank all of them who contributed to an event that we clearly did not even cater for. We didn't recognize. And it tells you that as, as Minister Gonzalez said, it's not always about money. It's about vision. Mm -hmm. It's about passion. It's about love of country. Uh, somebody having an idea, keeping this, and at some point in time, say, look, I hand, I'm handing it over. You know. And the thing is this, and as, a, as the line minister for mm -hmm. our ministry that deals with a lot of the SDGs, this yes. also ties into SDG 4 in terms of speaking to quality to education, quality education. To allowing individuals yes. to yeah. know about themselves. So you're rooted in a sense of self so you can go forward with a level of confidence. And I believe it's ericwilliams.gov.tt. Yes. That is where individuals well, can you, know. Well, so that's well, Eric Williams. You, you already have it. <laughs> and as you speak about the education, of course, it's almost $8 billion. And you talked about one of the, what are the things we remember, mm -hmm. that the fact that you can, this, this grant that's now available for $1,000. I mean, um, so many people listening, they have children, three, four, um, and, you know, as members of parliament, they come to you, you know, you go to a bookstore, even for somebody in a primary school, it can get as much as a thousand, twelve, fifteen hundred dollars. Those who are going to secondary school, it can comfortably reach um, uh, four thousand dollars. So I, uh, it's about sixty five thousand people that will be impacted mm -hmm. by this thousand dollar grant, which we know it's going to make a big, big difference. And I want to go back into something that you would have said, Minister Gonzalez, and you, you, you spoke about sometimes it's not just the money, but it is how you use that money. And that is something that you've been speaking about uh, for a while now. Mm -hmm. Transformation, a level of efficiency. You, 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 you've been called the record breaker. What are some <laughs> of those, I don't know if it's, is it low hanging fruit that we see that we can take advantage of as they would have been presented today by the finance minister, uh, opportunities that are there, but possibly what is just needed is the is the way that you look at it. Because even going, we've seen the we see we've seen the names and the titles of the budget presentations get a little lengthier, get a little lengthier. So you know, from turn around in 2019, stability, strength, growth, mm -hmm. resetting the economy for growth and innovation, resilience in the face of a global pandemic, tenacity and stability in the face of global challenges, and building capacity for diversification and growth within a mm -hmm. world of challenges. <laughs> so yes, there, there, there's, there's some length to it, but in terms of what does that mean, in terms of that level of focus on transformation, in terms of the way that things can get done, so when you look at the allocations to the various ministries, Ministry of Public Utilities, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Works and Transport, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Housing, you see projects that can be undertaken at the community level. For example, Ministry of Housing. Minister Beckles could tell you the HVIP, Housing and Village Improvement Program, has been a tremendous program to a lot of our constituents. I remember walking on the hills of um, Windy Hill in the local government campaign. I felt a sense of pride as a member of parliament to see the number of HVIP homes that were constructed over the last year. And that would have been as a result of people coming to the constituency office, um, expressing the, their desire to improve their living conditions, living in squalor conditions, and the constituency office working with them to submit their applications to the LSA, getting the grants, and the small contractors going into the communities to construct these low-cost housing that impacted tremendously the lives of thousands of our citizens. But when they go in there, they go in and they employ people from the community, from the family, who probably might be the beneficiary of, of that grant. So the government made a commitment today that I think over $100 million is going to be spent on the housing and village improvement grant. If that is in fact the case, 
And if we can expend that $100 million commitment that the government has made today in the national budget in areas all across Trinidad and Tobago, you're not only transforming lives at the family level by providing a home, but it generates all kinds of economic activities in that in, in the various communities across Trinidad and Tobago, getting people employed, albeit on a short-term basis. And if you do the same thing in the Ministry of Agriculture by the construction of all of these um, agricultural access roads and all of these projects that we have identified, making sure that these projects are you know, being executed at the community level, Ministry of Housing, Ministry of Public Utilities, all of these aging pipelines that we are putting down all over. One of the things that we insist is that the, some of the contractors that we're utilizing, that they employ people within the community and the people take a sense of ownership because now they are working on projects that are transforming their lives and the lives of their community. The same thing for Ministry of Works. We boasted today that Ministry of Works had 500 projects across Trinidad and Tobago. If we can utilize the allocation for Ministry of Works and Transport in the communities, like in Penny's um, constituency in a repo in Lopino in Surrey, I had a protest this morning, well coordinated, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for the thing, of course, what you did. Timing, 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 they will generate all kinds of activities, all kinds of economic activities, employment activities, etc. And that is replicated all over Trinidad and Tobago. We will see massive growth in and this country. I don't know if I... Let me, let me try to steal <laughs> two minutes because you've spoken about communities so much. This two minutes is yours, so you're going to try to really curb your enthusiasm, Mr. Jack, <laughs> because I think we're going to be taking... We will make sure. <laughs> <laughs> but when you, you talk about communities, and let me be accountable in the sense that the Minister Rawi said it's one thing to speak in studio, but he invited us out to see some of the work that is being done under his line ministry. Property tax, impact of that on communities. That is transformative. I remember when, um, in my early discussions with the Minister of Finance, I welcomed the opportunity and for the reintroduction of, of property tax in the Tobago context, because Tobago, unlike um, all the other municipalities, we collect taxes on behalf of the government and we keep it and we net it off. So the property tax would have been additional funding for Tobago for, you know, for capital development. And that is where we needed the additional funding. So everyone who's talking against property tax, you know, ask some of the persons who are mm -hmm. against it. Uh, you own property in Miami? Do you pay property tax when you go abroad? Of course. And for less than a bottle, $54 a month, that's, that's a bottle of what? Um, and I'm not sure. But probably a bottle of cider, or pay or mm -hmm. if so much, that you are contributing to national economic development. And when you put it down, so simple, persons are saying, well, I want to make a contribution. Mm -hmm. Let's all make a contribution. And, and that is a conversation that we, we should be having. How can I contribute to my country? This is my country. Mm -hmm. This is sweet TNT. And let me tell you something. You can travel all over the world, but there's nowhere as sweet as the capital of paradise, of course, Tobago, mm -hmm. and sweet <laughs> TNT. So I want to leave that here. And let us, let us ignore the naysayers and look at the fact. And the minister spelled it out so clinically so comprehensively articulating in the need for property tax, property tax and really what you are paying. So again, I want to urge all citizens, let us come on board, submit the necessary documentations, and let us contribute to, to the development of Trinidad and Tobago. But just very quickly, let's think about any country in the world yes. where you did not receive property tax for 13 years. 13 years. Okay? Um, and just to take up a bit on what Joel is saying, I mean, we, as Trinidadians and Tobagonians, we love to compare, you know, That's when you right. travel, That's um, right. you know, and you talk about how clean right. the air mm -hmm. is, you mm -hmm. talk about what's happening in the school, you talk about recycling, 
but we all know that the only reason uh, where you can get um, the, the quality of the services That's is right. by virtue of the fact that people pay, pay taxes. taxes. Right. Um, so that the expectation when you, you, you share that experience that you go somewhere, um, and we all understand you go to New York or you go to different parts of Europe and you, you drop something. I mean, you, you pay a fine, you don't put the correct color bin outside, you don't put the proper trash outside, you pay your taxes. The mm -hmm. schools are run because people pay their taxes. Um, and, and as I think we all agree, the significance, I mean, the impression was being created that people have to sell their houses and the taxes that you have to pay will be so phenomenal. The critical thing about the question that you have asked is really the link with local government reform and what will happen, because Mr. Imbert mentioned now that all the corporations, all 14 corporations, will now be able to collect taxes. I'm a former local government councillor, and you understand that the existing allocations went mainly to wages and salaries with very little allocation for the development program. Now, the mayors and chairmen will have the opportunity in collecting those taxes now to determine on projects that can be done in the respective corporations. So Jack, you kept it to time, but we appreciate you. <laughs> well, at this point, you take a short break. Stay with us. We return with a budget in focus. Sweetest 100 days of Christmas are here again. This season, let's go ahead and plan early. So take out those Christmas decorations, deck the halls, and turn on your favorite Christmas station. It's Christmas and Sweet TNT. We've got Christmas cover for you with giveaways, karaoke, parade, soca parade, Christmas songs, carols, and the gathering. The biggest charity Christmas concert and collection drive. This Christmas season on Sweet 100 FM, let's celebrate the sweetest 100 days of Christmas. wife and I were out on a day of fishing and we had just finished fishing this one spot and as we headed across to the new spot we could see in the distance there was a bunch of dolphins on the surface. You are dearer to me than all the stars So many wish but never reach When I'm falling and all the world seems dark You help me find my peace Oshun mi ba, mi ba, mi jani Oshun mi ba, mi ba, ye Oshun mi ba, mi ba, mi jani Arubita
Welcome back to Budget in Focus. We've had another switch and Mr. Remy is back with us. So your thoughts on the discussion thus far, Mr. Remy? It's very interesting, you know, and, and I am happy that we have the ministers present, you know, because I, I said to Minister Gonzalez when we were at the boardroom, you know, there are some things I believe if things are happening, then there is a gap with, between the actions and how people feel it on the ground. And it's something they need to address very soon because the sentiment is that things are not reaching downstairs to the average man on the street. If it's a communication challenge, I think that they need to correct the communication channel. If it's a connection issue, I think they, we're supposed to relook the role of MPs and ministers. It is a difficult and a tedious exercise. And I think a lot of times MPs are disconnected from their constituents because of other duties that they are called upon to perform. And that is a structural issue I think we may need to look at in the country. How do we address good representation at the constituency level without impacting on the need to work at the government level? If we have to, maybe constitutional change has been touted in the past. It's something that Fighton had advocated some years ago. Mm -hmm. We may need to relook the whole representative structure that we have to allow for our MPs to properly represent their constituents. And not only that, sometimes you have issues, and I think it might be prudent to discuss them with the constituents before you go to debate, to debate in Parliament, so that they will feel that there's a sense of belonging and connectivity to the issues that are being discussed. And I think those are things that they need to look at, particularly with this budget. Go down to your constituents and, and feel the pulse, explain to them the things, talk to them, maybe in smaller forums and have them feel that they are part of the process. And maybe it should be done before and after. And there's some things I feel that all governments, I'm saying it from a, I am a red, white and black, I've always said that. I have strictly believe in Trinidad and Tobago. And I think whichever party comes into power, they should look at how they relate to their constituents because at the end of the day, they have been elected to represent people at the ground level. And when you say when you say smaller fora, is it a matter of having cottage meetings and less? It could be a combination uh, of a few things. Yeah. You could have cottage meetings, you have some of the broader mass meetings where based on the demographics, you may have to do a, a, a hybrid of those things. And so we're here discussing the budget as well as things that impact the significance, potential. What are some of the things that we need to look at going forward? So I just want you to give us an idea because something that was put forward a little while ago, Labour Economic Alternative Plan. Can I just say that, that that statement before that Mr. Remy made is so important mm -hmm. because I don't want us to bypass it because mm -hmm. I'm sure people are listening and people have all kinds of views about this topic of representation. Um, and when you're a minister of government and you have to do your representation, and of course it depends, like both Minister Gonzalez and myself have a very large constituency. Like most people don't have a clue that Arima really starts in part of the Las Cuevas Forest. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and you're going all the way, and people try to figure out what is the relationship between Arima and all those other communities, Blanchichés, La Follette, Mon Lacroix, Paria, mm -hmm. Heights of a repo. Now, in a lot of other countries in the world, Parliament actually closes for a period. And that is when you see your constituency. If you go like Canada, you know, uh, United have States, yes, you have it's uh, your period or in your parliament is closed mm -hmm. and your constituency knows that this is your dedicated period. Whereas here, that's the total opposite. And people, of course, tie everything to elections. And they say, oh, we only see you for elections and we don't see you otherwise. And the extent to which that relationship, I mean, that structure that he says exists, you know, is how do you strike that balance? Because the expectations, the explanation, uh, as I said a while ago, you know, when you do the budget, what is in it for me? You see people, well, did the gas go up? There are certain things that they think about, and if you can't deliver that, then they think that you haven't done your proper representation. I was very happy that he raised it. And you have something to add because I have a question yeah. to you. Because you that, is, no, uh, that is a very, very good point. I'm happy that Mr. Remy raised it and uh, Minister Beckles' uh, contribution towards it because the work of a member of parliament is a full-time job. 
the work of a minister of government is also full time. And there was a point in time I remember the Prime Minister in talking about potential constitutional reform. One of the things that was being exposed was the possibility of having full time MPs, you understand, to attend to their duties because as a member of parliament, it is not only about standing in the parliament and contributing to debates. There are so many things that happen in the background. As being a member of parliament, you are served on so many joint select committees. They take up a lot of your time. You represent your constituents at those um, joint select committees and participating in them almost on a daily basis. And you now have to juggle that with your ministerial duties. You understand? So it is a very, very critical point because people expect when they vote for you that you can, they would only regard proper representation when they see you in front of their door, they expect to see you in front of their homework in the streets, etc. But the job of a member of parliament, you are a legislator. You are there to influence the policies at that high level that will impact the lives of your constituents. And you do so by contributing, researching to the debates in parliament, representing them at joint select committees, holding, you know, um, and all of these committees that take place in the background. And that's how you represent and that's how you're supposed to represent. And of course, from time to time, you will have your meetings, you meet your, uh, the constituents on constituency days, and you will have time where you will walk some of the areas, talk to people, engage in meetings, etc., representing, going to some of the village council meetings, and, and it, it's quite a lot of activities quietly that is taking place in the background. But oftentimes you hear comments being made of members of parliament, which is very unfortunate, because oftentimes people do not understand what the job of a member of parliament is all about. But we take responsibility. People expect you to give them money if they don't have money to go to school, um, if they don't have things to eat. They come and they... Is, you literally are a mom and a dad. That's like part of your function. Okay. You understand? And, and, and actually, I mean, we can go into so much details. We don't wear that on our shoulders. People don't understand the weight that we carry. And we, have, we need to have a smile on our faces and pretend as though everything is perfect. And oftentimes, it is done to the detriment of our health and our family life. But as leaders, as members of parliament, we are committed to the task. And the president would have said in her maiden speech as president, she often asked herself, as a previous member of parliament, why people are attracted to this job. You understand? And I'll tell you this, as a Minister Beckles could tell you, I'm a Minister of Public Utilities. The General Manager of TNT works for twice time more money than I do. The General Manager or the CEO of TSTT works for, for three or four times more money than I do. Everybody. You understand? Don't say for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the I same thing for, yeah, you know, for, for Wasa. You understand? You are a minister. Everything that goes wrong in those state agencies they tie it like a burning tire around your neck. The simplest things. But yet still, you could go on and tell the people of Toronto Tobago that you should be paid more or perhaps equal to these you people. You two tires. But, but, in the, <laughs> but in the sense that I want to link two, I want to juxtapose two comments that would have been made, one by you, Minister Gonzalez, one by you, Mr. Remy. And looking at the fact that you said you found the 10 of the presentation was upbeat, it was positive. Mm -hmm. And tying that to the statement that in terms of color, Mr. Remy, you are red, white, and black. There may be individuals who are a little less than red, white, and black. Mm -hmm. And to the person who may have the comments, comment is a word you also used, that the tenor of this budget presentation was this upbeat because it's just after a local government election and it's coming before a general election in 2025. What did you tell that person? I would tell the person, look at this budget in the context of the eight years that preceded it. The challenges that we face as a country with so many economic headwinds and how we performed well, despite all of the naysayers. There were people, you know, um, influencers, I would call them, or editorial writers, at one point in time was calling upon this government to devalue the local currency. They were telling this government to go to the IMF, 
to bail out this country to get money to spur economic activities. You understand? They were saying every Monday morning that the economy collapsed. And that is not COVID that collapsed the economy, it's the PNM that collapsed the economy. All of these negatives is as though nothing good was happening in this country. Minister Beckers could tell you, during this COVID pandemic, several times we sat in the cabinet and we saw the Minister of Finance bringing notes before the cabinet to dip into the Heritage and Stabilization Fund to make sure that public sector workers get their salaries, make sure that the old age pensioners get their, 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 their pension, make sure that all of the people who want public assistance, their grants, etc., make sure that um, public sector workers get their salaries. You understand? All of that happened because we had access to a Heritage and Stabilization Fund because during this time, our revenues collapsed. Oil prices went down to five dollars. It went into negative um, numbers at one at one point in time. Which country in the Caribbean was able to manage in difficult circumstances like that, without sending home any worker in the public sector that paid salaries timely on every month? Pay your social grant. We maintain a social safety grant of five billion dollars. We increased it by giving. Um, rent to some business owners, food security, food boxes, and I could go on and on and on. We were able to do that and manage in difficult circumstances like that during this period of time of doom and gloom, death and mayhem all over the world. And this little country, facing all of these headwinds, was able to rise like a phoenix out of this ash and today can present a national budget with a just a four of or $5 billion, $4 billion in, in deficit. At one point in time, it was $16 billion in deficit. All of that we were able to do. And if today the government is saying that we are putting forward proposals to assist parents to purchase books and uniform for our, 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 for our children, to educate our children, to increase the minimum wage, all of that could only been done because of prudent management of the economy over the last six, seven, or eight years. You could only deny that if you intend on wearing your political colors and trying to evade the facts and reality that are before us. But in terms of that, uh, looking, even speaking of the food boxes, one of the things I look forward to is seeing ways that we can maximize what our farmers, fisher folk are yeah. producing yeah. to and bring that, make it more accessible. There are different people doing that on the ground as well in terms of the Alliance of Rural Communities, ArcTT. So and making those links between the people who make and the people who are able to consume Pretty because we're on the ground doing that. That's exactly what it is. I mean, you see now that um, the minister talked, for example, of incentives for the cocoa industry, mm -hmm. talked about re rejoining the International Coffee Organization, yeah talked about dealing with Pradia lastly. Oh, so clearly, if you're not just giving a card, but you're also going to get, I mean, I'm sure you remember the days during COVID where people were able to get, I mean, this stuff, you got the pumpkin, you got with the Karaili, spinach. I mean, and what it did is that so often we criticize the farmers and we talked about our inability to produce. Mm -hmm. And we saw during that COVID period that the country was able to produce um, these products to the extent that every week, I mean, it was thousands and thousands of pounds, That's whether it be potatoes, and again, we are here again through the policy, giving the farmers another opportunity again to grow the produce and for us to eat healthy as well. And in looking at those management is a thing that looks at all angles, seeing how we could... Uh, yes turn your hand to make fashion and just getting those ideas and bringing them to the table. So before I forget, Leap, ex explain it for me, please, in terms of like that, uh, that labor economic alternative plan. That, this is something that we had put forward some years ago. This is not of recent vintage. This is something that the labor movement had sat with some very progressive economic thinkers in the country. And we came up when we felt that the country was having some challenges. We came up with what we recommended as the alternative economic plan. And one of the things I heard the minister mention it today, one of the fundamental areas he made mention of was the tax gap, that, that big hole that we were seeing. At that time, it was measured around $13 billion mm -hmm. in tax evasions, avoidance, all different things. 
And we felt that if there was some avenue to recoup, if it was at least 75% of that, and put it into some kind of industrial policy where you can have more industrial development, which will now create employment opportunities and things. If you go through the document, you can see we talk about those things. We talk about the, that time petition was still operational, and we were using it to in, in widen the amount of products that were coming out of the refinery. So when you re realize the income from the tax avoidance, and I don't think <coughs> the revenue authority is the only way to do that. Eh? We are afraid to go at the big ones who are committing crimes. I make that with, say that without apologies. That is the problem in this country. We know them, but we don't go at them. And they avoid it over and over. Successive governments, it has happened. And I believe that if we go at those persons, it has happened with the NIB. They are those employers who are avoiding paying their contribution on behalf of employers. And it is, it is affecting the ability of NIB to realize the kind of returns to pay the benefits that they're supposed to pay. Look at the report that came out now. There is a gap between benefits being paid and contributions received. And, and it is being blamed on the retirement age and on the retirement the contribution. But there's, there's also that evasion that is taking place there. And you remember a trade union at one time filed an action against an employer for failing to pay and, and those things are criminal offenses. And we are saying, arrest those things, bring it back to a level of stability. And, and then you would realize that there is no need for some of the expensive structural um, program that we are putting to, to bring in revenues. Remember there was a time we had a lot of um, those special purpose companies that were established to do things that should have been done in the ministry. Okay. One of our positions was those things should have been abandoned because they were an additional cost to the government. And now that has been realized and you see some of those, they have okay. been dismantled because it was a duplication of efforts with an additional cost. And we felt those things. So LEAP was, was trying to see if we could have an alternative plan for economic growth and development in the country. And it is still valid in some of the areas. Some of the things we are seeing being mentioned are some of the things that we had mentioned in LEAP some years ago. And we believe that, that it is still a viable doc document that should be looked at and, and engage the movement in discussions. And, and we have said it, you know, and I, I will say this here, in the absence of consult with my other comrades at the, fed at the other federations, but we were always prepared and will always be prepared to sit at the table of tripartism. But it must be meaningful and it must be genuine. Mm -hmm. It is not, we are not sitting as a charade to say that we are part of a tripart tripartite process and, and there is no meaningful, tangible mm -hmm. outcome that will bring about some economic development. And the trade union movement will remain prepared to sit there once it is a meaningful, purposeful, and it is not to us a window dressing to say there is tripartism. We, we would have been articulating for that all along. Social dialogue is a cornerstone of industrial development in any country. And we will continue to make ad advocacy to have it done properly, legislated through parliament. We said that. Once it is done that way, then it takes away what may be considered and perceived as political influence in the process of tripartism, which should not be. ILO speaks clearly about what it should be. And, and those are some of the areas I would hope and that we will see develop. And I always have a peeve. While I'm, I have the Labour hat, I have a strong credit union hat too. And, and the United Nations Secretary General did a report recently on the role cooperatives could play in social and economic development. And one of the things he articulated was a credit unions to be seated cooperatives at the policy making tables. Credit unions are not involved in policy decisions that affect the economy and effect, we have 600,000 600, members in the movement. And when there are major policy decisions that are being taken, we are not considered in any of those discussions. And I, we believe that that should be something that should be addressed. He also recommended that cooperative education should be reintroduced at, in a, the curriculum in secondary and primary schools because it gives and it imbues in these young citizens that value systems, that belief in cooperativism, not the individualism that we've seen destroying the country. And, and we would continue to advocate for that to be part of the curriculum in primary and secondary schools because we believe it would aid every government in reducing crime because it takes the people into a productive area. And the minister talked about cocoa 
and the farmers and things. We believe cooperatives are the way that they should go. They benefit from economies of scale. And, and that will aid them in terms of the output that we will see coming out. And those are the kind of relationships we would want to see between the people centered, people sector, credit union, trade unions, and governments and business. We are prepared and willing once it is meaningful and purposeful. Leave it here. Yeah. And ministers are here. We don't have you all for much longer. So I saw some writing in red ink. So <laughs> ask me if, we, if I get some ways to sh sh share some of that before, before we say thank you. Maybe she's got putting red ink by what I said. I mean, one, one, one of the things going back into the um, going back into the to the the theme again, you know. Um, diversification, and I think one of the big things is the maritime sector that was that was mentioned. Um, and you know, you you take a drive down to Shagaramas and you see what's going going on there. Uh, we don't always recognize that Trinidad Tobago is very blessed in that uh, that is one of the sheltered areas uh, where you would you know if you during the hurricane season in particular, where people can bring their 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 boats and their vessels that way. And you would get insurance, unlike if you take it to a couple other industries. So other countries, sorry. So here it is, Minister mentioned about the studies, the research, um, and the fact that you are now going to have training for young people in that particular sector, which I think for us, again, going back to the whole issue of diversification, that's one of the things I really wanted to mention because I thought it's important. Of course, the other big thing is the um, public servants and the back pay. Uh, the minimum wage. I think that is, I mean, because I, I started by saying that so very often, and that's linked to Mr. Remini's point about communication, um, you know, because there is this concern when people go to the market, you go to the grocery, you know, what's the impact? So in some cases, depending on if you're a 40 hour work week or depending that some people will get a $500 increase, some people will get ending up getting a $900 increase in terms of the improvement of their monthly package. And in most instances, they're still not going to be paying tax because of that threshold. And I, I think that that is, that is good news. I was really happy to hear that about the yachting sector too, because yes. it's something that they've been calling for for a while, saying yes, yes. it's right here, yeah. it's available. Yeah, Let's do it, please. Into something real, because it's not the first time I've heard that. Mm -hmm. And, and it, I've heard it in previous budget presentations, and I remember Comrade Annie said, raising that as one of his proposals, because the Seamen and Waterfront Workers Trade Union, that, that the, the maritime industry should be one of the levers for diversification. It's plenty years now. And I would hope that two more budget presentations down the road, we don't, we're not talking that it's something that should happen and, and again. We're seeing, and we're seeing things happening <laughs> eh, in, <laughs> and in other jurisdictions yes, because what the, is happening yes, in Yes, the big difference as well is as bringing in this apprenticeship, right? The apprenticeship program, I think that is, that is excellent because now you have... You know where people could be accredited, you could be certified, and I, I think that make a big difference in terms of the transition mm -hmm. from um, simply going there to work, and now you realizing that you want the certification, which makes a big difference between um, you know getting an X amount of dollars and probably even setting up a business. And with that, we want to thank you very much, sure. Minister Beckles. We want to thank you very much, Minister Gonzalez. We take a <laughs> short break, and then I guess we go back to the original, well, should I say the original cast? Yes. But stay with us. We come back with more. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure. Yes, exactly. Line and Length, the number one cricket program in the West Indies, is on TTT. Line and Length brings you up-to-date interviews, analysis, and highlights on the game in the region and internationally. Plus, there's an added bonus to receive a gift of gear each month with our grassroots program. Go to lineandlength.net to learn more. Line and Length, in association with Massey United Insurance on TTT. This is a message from the Office of the Disaster Preparedness and Management, a division of the Ministry of National Security. Be ready for tropical storm conditions. Monitor weather updates from the TT Met Office. Make family emergency plan. Know your emergency numbers in case of hazard impacts. Clean drains and gutters around your home or business. Secure your roofs to prevent damage from high winds. 
Trim trees around your property. Prepare an emergency kit to last a minimum of 72 hours. Store non-perishable food and water to last a minimum of 72 hours. Store extra face masks and hand sanitizers. Photograph, scan and protect copies of important documents. For more information, visit the ODPM website at www.odpm.gov.tt. Congratulations to the Nicole Larson Live Show, which received special mention in the Best Magazine Program category at the CBU Caribbean Media Awards in August 2023. An encore of Nicole Larson Live, living in victory every day. Mondays at 8 p.m. with repeats on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. and Sundays at 5.30 p.m. on TTT. Kids, speak up against abuse. It is not acceptable for you to be abused in any manner. From your parents, family members, members or peers. You, you, you have the right to refuse, to refuse the abuse. Report it to anyone. Guidance counselors, doctors, teachers or even your neighbors. Anyone, anyone who can help. Speak up against abuse. Speak up. Speak up. Speak up. Speak up. Break the silence. Child abuse is one secret you should never keep. I really don't like to complain, but I can't understand. The way they do street some are weak, Calypsonian. As you make a mistake whatsoever. Born out of a desire to create a shift in the atmosphere which surrounded the Calypso Gael, enter the tent which replaced the palm leaf roof with a piece of tarpaulin, bamboo benches with actual chairs, and the introduction of an orchestra to accompany the Calypsonians and kerosene lamps and flambeau to light the way. Calypso tent that had real pedigree too. Who could forget Calypso spectacular on Henry Street? Where true, true, true Calypso finds they would meet. Well, it's always a good conversation when you run out of time as opposed to things to say. <laughs> so we are on the home stretch. We have Mr. Joseph Renmi, Mr. Kaim Sheikh, and Mr. Joel Jack, and myself, DK Roster, taking it through to the finish line. Thank you for staying with us. And if you're joining, welcome. But we are speaking about the budget as well as things around the budget. And gentlemen, I want you to know, sometimes it feels as though, so you were talking about communication and whether or not that communication is going where it needs to. Uh, and sometimes I want, wonder whether or not it's a matter of things, individuals, people, collectives, corporations on the ground making moves and that are undeniable. So then policymakers facilitate or is there some happy medium? Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that, Mr. Sheikh? Sorry, can you repeat that for me again? So is it, is it, do we always have to go from top down? Do we have to come from bottom up? Can we, so, and, and I, see, I see Mr. Jack jumping at the bit, so. Let, let me jump in, right? yeah. in, in let, me, let me jump in here. But in terms of crafting policy, the, the, the consultative process is very important. And I think that is how we, we got to the creation of Vision 2030. In the Tobago context, we shaped our policy um, via, you know, via a series of consultation with the stakeholders, with the community. Um, we crafted a comprehensive economic development plan for Tobago, the first iteration, the, the second 2.0. And recently when I was in office, we crafted the medium-term planning framework for Tobago in terms of advancing the island's development and effecting policy in an inclusive manner, ensuring that all the stakeholders are informed that, they, that their input is valued and taking into consideration and moving the process forward. And, and I think that is important in, in moving forward. And I think as the, the budget is anchored on Vision 2030, I think all of Trent Amigo, you have a platform um, based on a consultative process, based on a continuation of the development plan, Vision 2020, which I, I believe all of Trent Amigo we were proud of. We, we had hope to look at the future and say, well, we have, we have made our input. 
this that is the destination we're all on board and let's get there together and we saw if we worked and if those plans rolled out what would be the benefit the long-term benefit for the country so so it's important and um we have a legacy to live on and in a bigger context that's part of my concern as well um you're wondering there is no medium term planning framework there is no document we are just seeing a patchwork of ideas but nationally i think all of Trinidad and Tobago, and I would want to encourage persons to read the budget document. You may not have time to sit for four hours and listen, but go to the document and see what is in it for you and how you can benefit the entrepreneur, the business person, the young adult, you making career, long-term decisions. Um, you know, there is something in there for everyone. If I can add to what Mr. Jack was saying there, the thing that I see with the policies is that they are very high level. And we need to probably break it down significantly because yes it is they have these ideas which it is don't really materialize and if it is we look industry by industry and we then break it down into the subsector and we then maybe take policies that could apply to each one of those and even look at it at different geographical areas because some of the issues in the east are different from south and so forth then it is i think that we could get to a budget that is more applicable easier and we could actually see more of it come into life and just having these high-level policies that we repeat every so often, and they may not actually come through. That's I think the people opinion. asking, was in it for me? That's right. I think that, that is the problem with the average person outside there. <clears throat> and and so she is right again. We, we talk at this level, but the man on the street, the average John Doe and those person outside there, how is this budget going to impact on their lives? So I'm hearing the grandiose thing about a $3 increase in the minimum wage. How is that going to impact on the lives of someone who is now going to move from, I think it's 2,800 to 3,500? If that person has a, is a family person with two children and has to pay a rent or even a mortgage, you have already exceeded the minimum wage. And, and, and what we were saying in the labor movement is, that is why we had pegged it at $30, because we felt it was a livable wage. And I don't say living wage because the living wage is a different economic argument. Because you have to ensure that the, the United Nations said the person should be able to have at least a pay for food, shelter, education, and, and those kind of things that will say that the value now represents what the person could live on. And, and I'm asking, what was the scientific method that was used? to determine the appropriateness of $20.50. Who was consulted in that process? And we talk about consultation, and Mr. Jack mentioned it, but there was no consultation with the trade union movement. So it is like a ticket out from my back pocket, like how we do for election day, and I spring it in the budget, and I get beat up the desk in parliament. But the person who has to go in the grocery can't beat no desk, you know. It is going to impact on them. And what is going to happen now is that businessmen are going to increase prices, across the board for everybody and persons who are not beneficial to any increase will have to pay increased cost in the groceries and at the pump where, wherever it is and in addition to that now we, we, we are talking about a back pay around Christmas time I have an issue with that you, you're encouraging consumerism you know and, and it, it's, it's, it's something that we try to avoid and alleviate why we carry collective bargaining to the point where it is now dependent on back pay. Who is going to benefit from that? Because we, we place people in debt and then bring them in a situation around Christmas time. What are you going to do with that money? And that is why we are saying we have to do it in the credit union movement now to educate them about the proper use of their funds. But the temptation is there. The temptations are always there because they have to survive. And, and, and those are the things I'm saying. Those are the discussions that should be had with the people sector so that we could get the better ideas how those things should be implemented and rolled out. But the, again, we say the people talk consultation, but consultation does not mean I come to you and talk to you until this is what I'm doing. That is how we interpret consultation in most instances in this country. And we are <coughs> going to be finishing before 9 o'clock. We have a minute each for closing arguments, thoughts. Mr. Jack, what look at you? You're looking like you. Because I saw you with some post it notes as well. Huh? But try, try. Yes, sir. No, 60 seconds, difficult. But again, <laughs> I am very optimistic about the future, not cautiously, but um, the minister 
and of course the administration should be commended in terms of the um, their fiscal prudence, the conservative approach in terms of managing, um, I would say, three shocks from 2015, that initial just decline in the oil prices. Um, I mean, I was I was Secretary of Finance and I had to recalibrate my budget estimate. So, so I understood. And then we 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 came out of COVID. We came out of COVID better. And now we are grappling with the 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 Ukraine Russia war. And as an administration, we have managed well. You know, the administration has managed well. Um, and I think in terms of the plans outlined today in the, that comprehensive budget presentation, the young person, the elderly, all sectors of the economy have, uh, you know, I think that they should be buoyed by what was presented today. We are hopeful. And the future looks brighter for Trent Tobago. The numbers suggest that the IMF in Article 4 echoed a similar sentiments, the Moody's in their um, rating exercise, S&P. All international agencies have given this government an approval rating. So I don't want to exceed my 60 seconds, but I think all of Trinity Bigo should be hopeful, as I said earlier, read the budget document, parents, entrepreneurs, the elderly, everyone, the businessman, everyone, read the document for yourself and ensure that you can guide your children um, to the future that is before them. And I will say the future looks brighter for Trinidad and Tobago. You don't want to exceed it again. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, fix it, don't fix it, Mr. Remy, but Mr. Sheikh, you have the, you have the last. Yeah. I'll, I'll do it in 60 <laughs> seconds, definitely. The budget is a, a very simple budget, in my opinion. It's just what it is we've done before, but I'm really looking forward to a long-term perspective. I'm looking for development in the agricultural sector, which could help to reduce the amount of foreign exchange that we use to import food. Let's have some food sovereignty. Let's look at some of the things like simple things like sweet potato, cassava, trying to get those things going. Look at the national carbohydrate intakes, how we can move away from rice to that. And assist the farmers in getting to where they need to be, assist them with the commercialization, and that will indirectly remove the foreign exchange problem to an extent, and it will even create a lot of employment, especially for the unskilled workers. And once we have employment, we'll reduce crime. And I think we need to take some harder steps towards fixing the economy and we need to definitely put the money behind agriculture which I didn't see this budget but I'm hoping that next time it's there. We want to thank you very much Mr. Kaim Sheikh, we want to thank you Mr. Joel Jack, Mr. Joseph Remy, Ministers Penelope Beckles and uh, Marvin Gonzalez and we want to thank you for tuning in. This has been Budget in Focus on DK Ronstadt. Thank you so much for tuning in. in the National Lottery on Nigeria on Monday, 2nd October 2023. At 10.30 a.m., they weigh them 13 grapple, 